ostrich palm of the other one. He had always laughed at what he called my cock and bull story about the colonel, but he looked very scared and puzzled now that the same thing had come upon himself. Why, what on earth does this mean, John? He stammered. My heart had turned to lead. It is K K K, said I. He looked inside the envelope. So it is, he cried. Here are the very letters, but what is written above them? Put the papers on the sundial, I read, peeping over his shoulder. What papers? What sundial? he asked. A sundial in the garden. There is no other, said I, but the papers must be those that are destroyed. Pooh, said he, gripping hard at his courage. We are in a civilized land here, and we can't have tomfoolery of this kind. Where does the thing come from? From Dundee, I answered, glancing at the postmark. Some preposterous practical joke, said he. What have I to do with sundials and paper? I shall take no notice of such nonsense. I should certainly speak to the police, I said. And be laughed at for my pains? <laughs> Nothing of the sort. Then let me do so. No, I forbid you. I won't have a fuss made about such nonsense. It was in vain to argue with him, for he was a very obstinate man. I went about, however, with a heart which was full of forebodings. On the third day after the coming of the letter, my father went from home to visit an old friend of his, Major Freebody, who was in command of one of the forts over Ports Downhill. I was glad that he should go, for it seemed to me that he was farther from danger where he was away from home. In fact, however, I was in error. Upon the second day of his absence, I received a telegram from the Major, imploring me to come at once. My father had fallen over one of the deep chalk pits which abound in the neighbourhood, and was lying senseless with a shattered skull. I hurried to him, but he passed away without ever recovering consciousness. He had, as it appears, been returning from Farham in the twilight, and as the country was unknown to him and the chalk pit unfenced, the jury had no hesitation in bringing in a verdict of death from accidental causes. Carefully as I examined every fact connected with his death, I was unable to find anything which could suggest the idea of murder. There were no signs of violence, no footmarks, no robbery, no record of strangers having been seen upon the roads, and yet I need not tell you that my mind was far from at ease, and that I was well nigh certain from some foul plot had been woven around him. In this sinister way I come into my inheritance. You will ask me why I did not dispose of it? My answer, because I was well convinced that our troubles were in some way dependent upon an incident of my uncle's life and that the danger would be as pressing as one house as one in the other. It was in January 85 that my poor father met his end, and two years and eight months have elapsed since then. During that time I have lived happily at Horsham, and I had begun to hope that this curse had passed away from the family, and that it has ended with the last generation. I had begun to take comfort too soon, however. Yesterday morning the blow fell in the very shape which it had found come upon my father. The young man took from his waistcoat a crumpled envelope, and turning to the table, he shook out upon it five little dried orange pips. This is the envelope, he continued. The postmark is London, Eastern Division, within the very words which are founded upon my la father's last message, K, 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 and then put the papers on the sundial. What have you done? asked Holmes. Nothing. Nothing? To tell the truth... He sank his face into his thin white hands. I have felt helpless. I have felt like one of those poor rabbits when the snake is writhing towards it. I seem to be in the grasp of some resistless, exonerable evil, which had no foresight and no precautions can guard against. Cried Sherlock Holmes. You must act, man, or you are lost. Nothing but energy can save you. There is no time for despair. I have seen the police. Ah! But they listened to my story with a smile. I am convinced the inspector has formed the opinion that the letters are all practical jokes, and that the deaths of my relations were really accidents, as the jury stated, and were not to be connected with the warnings. Holmes shook his clenched hands in the air. Incredible imbecility! he cried. They have, however, allowed me a policeman, who may remain in the house with me. Has he come with you tonight? No, his orders were to stay in the house. Again, Holmes raved in the air. Why did you not come to me? And above all, why did you not come at once? He cried. I did not know. It was only today that I spoke to Major Prendergast about my troubles and was advised by him to come to you. It is really two days since you had the letter. We should have acted before this. You have no further evidence, I suppose, than that which you have placed before us. No suggested detail which might help us. 
There is one thing, said John Openshaw. He rummaged in his coat pocket, and drawing out a piece of discoloured blue-tinted paper, he laid it out upon the table. I have some remembrance, said he, that on the day when my uncle burned the papers, I observed the small unburned margins which lay among the ashes were of this particular colour. I found this single sheet upon the floor of his room, and I am inclined to think that it may be one of the papers which has perhaps fluttered out from among the others. In that way he has escaped destruction. Beyond the mention of the pips, I do not see that it helps us much. I think myself it is a page from some private diary. The writing is undoubtedly my uncle's. Holmes moved the lamp, and we both bent over the sheet of paper, which showed by its ragged edge that it had been torn from a book. It was headed March 1869, and beneath were the following enigmatical notes. Fourth, Hudson came, same old platform. Seventh, set the pips on Macaulay, Paramore and John Swain of St. Augustine. Ninth, Macaulay cleared. Tenth, John Swain cleared. Twelfth, visited Paramore all well. Thank you, said Holmes, folding up the paper and returning it to our visitor. And now you must on no account lose another instant. We can't spare time even to discuss what you have told me. You must get home instantly and act. What shall I do? There is but one thing to do. It must be done at once. You must put this piece of paper which you had shown to us into the brass box which you have described. You must also put in a note to say that all the other papers were burned by your uncle, and that it is the only one that remains. You must assert that in such words as will carry conviction to them. Having done this, you must at once put the box out upon the sundial, as directed. Do you understand? Entirely. Do not think of revenge, or anything of the sort at present. I think that we may gain that by the means of the law, but we have our web to weave, which is theirs already woven. The first consideration is to remove the pressing danger which threatens you. The second is to clear up the mystery, and to punish the guilty parties. I thank you, said the young man, rising and pulling on his overcoat. You have given me fresh life and hope. I shall certainly do as you advise. Do not lose an instant, and above all take care of yourself in the meanwhile, for I do not think that there can be a doubt that you are threatened by a very real and imminent danger. How do you go back? By train from Waterloo. It is not yet nine. The streets you will be crowded, so I trust that you may be in safety, and yet you cannot guard yourself too closely. I am armed. That is well. Tomorrow I shall set to work upon your case. I shall see you at Horsham, then. No, your secret lies in London. It is there that I shall seek it. And I shall call upon you in a day or in two days with news as to the box and the papers. I shall take your advice in every particular. He shook hands with us and took his leave. Outside the wind still screamed and the rain splashed and pattered against the windows. This strange, wild story seemed to have come to us from amid the mad elements blown in upon us like a sheet of seaweed in a gale, and now to be reabsorbed by them once more. Sherlock Holmes sat for some time in silence, with his head sunk forward and his eyes bent upon the red glow of the fire. Then he lit his pipe, and leaning back in his chair, he watched the blue smoke rings as they chased each other up to the ceiling. I think, Watson, he remarked at last, that of all our cases, which we have had none more fantastic than this, Save perhaps the sign of four. Well, yes, save perhaps that. And yet this John Openshaw seems to me to be walking amid even greater perils than did the Sholtos. But have you, I asked, formed any definite conception as to what these perils are? There can be no question as to the nature, he answered. Then what are they? Who is this K.K.? K. K. And why does he pursue this unhappy family? Sherlock Holmes closed his eyes and placed his elbows upon the arms of his chair with his fingertips together. The ideal reasoner, he remarked, would, when he had once been shown a single fact in all its bearings, deduce from it not only all the chain of events which led up to it, but also all the results which would follow from it. As Cuvier could correctly describe a whole animal by the contemplation of a single bone, so the observer, who has thoroughly understood one link in a series of incidents, should be able to accurately state all the other ones, both before and after. We have not yet grasped the results which the reason alone can attain to. Problems may be solved in the study which have baffled all those who have sought a solution by the aid of their senses. To carry the art, however, to the highest pitch, it is necessary that the reasoner should be able to utilize all the facts which come to his knowledge, and this in itself implies, as you will readily see, a possession of all knowledge, 
which even in these days of free education and encyclopedias, it is a somewhat rare accomplishment. It is not so impossible, however, that a man should possess all knowledge which is likely to be useful in his work, and this I have endeavoured in my case to do so. If I remember rightly, you are, on one occasion, in the early days of our friendship, defined my limits in a very precise fashion. Yes, I answered, laughing. It was a singular document. Philosophy and astronomy and politics were marked zero, I remember. Botany, variable. Geology, profound as regards from the mudstains of, from reaching within fifty miles of town. Chemistry, eccentric. Anatomy, unsystematic. Sensational literature and crime records, unique. Violin player, boxer, swordsman, lawyer, and self-poisoner by cocaine and tobacco. Those, I think, were the main points of my analysis. Holmes grinned at the last item. Well, he said, I say now, as I said then, that a man should keep his little brain attic stocked with all the furniture that he is likely to use, and the rest that he can put away in the lumber room of his library, where he can get it if he wants it. Now, for such a case as the one which had been submitted to us tonight, we need certainly to muster all our resources. Kindly hand me down the letter K of the American Encyclopedia, which stands upon the shelf beside you. Thank you. Now, let us consider the situation which may be deduced from it. In the first place, we may start with a strong presumption that Colonel Openshaw had some very strong reason for leaving America. Men at his time of life do not change all their habits and exchange willingly the charming climate of Florida for the lonely life of an English provincial town. His extreme love of solitude in England suggests the idea that he was in fear of someone or something. So we may assume as a working hypothesis that it was fear of someone or something which drove him from America. As to what he feared, we can only deduce that by considering the formidable letters which he received by himself and his successors. Did you remark upon the postmarks of the letters? The first was from Pondicherry, the second from Dundee, and the third from London, from East London. What do you deduce from it? They are all seaports. That the writer was on board of a ship. Excellent. We have already found a clue. There can be no doubt that the probability, the strong probability, is that the writer was on board a ship. And now let us consider another point. In the case of Pondicherry, seven weeks elapsed between the threat and its fulfilment, and in Dundee it was only some three or four days. Does that suggest anything? A greater distance to travel. But the letter had also a greater distance to come, and I do not see the point. There is at least a presumption that the vessel in which the man or men was a, are is a sailing ship. It looks as if they always said their single warning or token before them when starting upon their mission. You see how quickly the deed followed the sign when it came to Dundee. If they had come from Pondicherry in a steamer, they would have arrived almost as soon as their letter. But as a matter of fact, seven weeks elapsed. I think that those seven weeks represented the difference between the mail boat which brought the letter and the sailing boat which brought the writer. It is possible. More than that, it is probable. And now you see the deadly urgency of this new case, and of why I urged young Openshaw to caution. The blow was always fallen at the end of the time which it had taken the senders to travel the distance, but this one comes from London, and therefore we cannot count upon delay. Oh, good God! I cried. What can it mean, this relentless persecution? The papers which Open Saw carried are obviously of a vital importance to the person or persons in the sailing ship. I think that it is quite clear that there must be more than one of them. A single man could not have carried out two deaths in such a way as to deceive a coroner's jury. There must have been several in it, and there must have been men of some resource and determination. Their papers they mean to have, be the holder of them whoever it is may. In this way, you see, KKK ceases to be the initials of an individual and becomes the badge of a society. But of what society? Have you never, said Sherlock Holmes, bending forward and sinking his voice, have you never heard of the Ku Klux Klan? Never have. Holmes turned over the leaves of the book upon his knee. Here it is, said he presently. Ku Klux Klan. A name derived from the fanciful resemblance to the sound produced by a cocking of a rifle. This terrible secret society was formed by some ex-Confederate soldiers in the southern states after the Civil War, and it rapidly formed local branches in different parts of the country, notably in Tennessee, Louisiana, the Carolinas, Georgia, and Florida. Its power was used for political purposes, 
principally for the terrorizing of the Negro voters and the murdering and driving from the